Thanks, guys, for joining. We'll make a start in about a minute or so. You can just see the numbers going up. I think it's 8.30, so I think we will make a start. So welcome to the third AST virtual event. Um, firstly, thank you for joining us. I hope you're all safe um, and healthy and um, your families too, of course. Um, and I hope you're, you're not missing football too much, but hopefully the next hour or so will just provide you with some information, a bit of an update on today in the Premier League meeting um, and also obviously some kind of a little bit more insight about what's happening in other countries and, and, and stuff like that. So as always, um, feel free to tweet out, use the hashtag AST event um, and that kind of just helps us monitor um, sort of what we're, what we're getting in and, and, and stuff like that. A few rules um, or, or, or more just kind of how the webinar works for people that haven't joined us before. There is a Q&A function. Um, so for those of you who joined us for our first two events, we didn't actually switch this on um, just purely because we were doing it for the first time. But there is a there is a Q&A function. So if you have got a question, you can ask it there. Um, I'm going to bring Nigel in for a bit of um, financials. If there's any questions, particularly for Nigel, ask them in the Q&A. Um, if you have got questions for Raf and, and Jules, then you can raise your hand and I'll, I'll bring you in um, where possible. You can still use the chat. There's a bit of a kind of what we have really liked is there's been a bit of a community feel to it. So that's that's obviously been great. So feel free to use the chat. If there are any questions, it's just a little bit more um, kind of um, sort of structured and, and, and stuff like that. So um, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm about to introduce Nigel. Um, Nigel, would you like to come in and give an update? Um, obviously, you, we did send a newsletter about the debt situation. Um, so that would be useful for you just to give the members an update about that. Thanks, Echo. Uh, good evening, everyone. As, as Echo said, this was attached to the, uh, the newsletter, which went out um, maybe at the weekend. So whilst we've we always write about the figures. We, we gave a, quite a detailed update on what COVID-19 means for the football club, football behind closed doors, broadcasting revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after a couple of questions from people, we thought we'd focus more on the current debt situation at the club. And then people can see that in the context of, of, um, of what, what has to be dealt with at the moment. So there's, um, it, it was in the newsletter and, and there's, three elements of, of Arsenal's debt situation. One, the principal one, is obviously around the construction of the, of the Emirates Stadium. That started off at £260 million when we moved in in July 2006, and that's currently down to, from 260, it's down to £144 million. And that will be fully repaid by 2031. So we've got another 11 years to be going. Um, that's costing about £20 million a year in repayments and, and interest. And um, there was a question from, from Emil Zelaki. Hello, Emil. Nice, nice that you could join us tonight. About <clears throat> when we took out the, bo the bond finance in 2006, some of the interest rates looked particularly high at the time. Well, they were the market in interest rates. We had the financial crisis in 2008-2009. Um, and now we're in a very low interest environment. So the, the decision was taken to fix those rates at the time um, for prudence reasons. 
and and it's like taking a, a fixed rate mortgage i mean you you take your choice whether you can afford the repayments at the time it would be very difficult now just to cancel those and um and pay lower rates of interest because there are obligations to the existing lenders to pay a certain amount of interest so you would have to break those contracts you would have to compensate people for the broken contracts and then and then start again so really it's not not going to happen the other elements of, of debt um, people may recall that when money was short for the stadium the um, the supporters were tapped again in the C and the D debentures that was 15 million pounds or that was what the repayment will be and that will come in the summer of 2028 so another long-term debts there and the and the other area which um, doesn't have a lot of focus is is the money we owe on on players so over the last three years about 300 million gross has been spent and and as is the way these days very few fees are paid and settled up front as on a multi-year staggered basis so arsenal's existing um, money they owe for players is 120 million pounds which we estimate 40 million of that is due um, will be due this summer so that's a, a very real and um, I'm not going to say it's a cliff edge. It'll be interesting. Most most clubs will be in that situation, so it'll be interesting to see how they they arrange who pays what. The um, I, I put in there how the other bits of the stadium were, were funded, and people sort of forget that. And Arsenal was talking earlier this week about how or last week how proud he was that that no other money was used and it was all Arsenal's money. So of the 430 million stadium funding there was 260 of, of debt and then there was 170 million of, of funds that Arsenal generated themselves and, and you can see in the newsletter some of it came from the Nike um, commercial sponsorship some of it came from from Emirates don't forget that ITV ended up with a 10% stake in Arsenal which half of that was for the new stadium that was 30 million um, the question another another question from from Emil the Delaware North that's the catering people we needed money up front. So for an upfront contribution of 15 million pounds, we gave them a 20, 20 year license for catering rights. We do receive some money, 21% um, of, of gross revenue. So there is some sharing for Arsenal there, um, but that, that, that's the way they put the money together. What does this all mean? Um, what, what's going to happen? Because we know we've got the overdraft with, with Barclays, which undoubtedly will be in, in use very shortly, if not already. Um, but what could happen, um, what could Stan do? It's, I don't want to say it's just Stan's problem, but Stan is 100% owner, as we all know. He could put in additional funds um, as a loan to be paid back at some time. He could put in additional capital. He could put money in and he could, he could turn those into, into shares so it's never repaid. He could guarantee facilities from, um, from further, further debt facilities from Barclays or new lenders or could he sell a stake in the club? Manchester United floated 10% of, of, or the Glazers floated 10% of, of Manchester United after they bought some of it. So those are, those are some of the options. Uh, John Ward, good question from John about possible sale and lease back on the stadium. As I say, there's 144 million still owing on it. To do the sale and lease back, you'd either have to arrange a deal to clear that and then take out some, some new debts or you'd have to get a second mortgage on it. So um, I think it's fair to say, John, there's, everything is up for, uh, up for discussion at the moment. And when Tim explains exactly where, where football could possibly be going in the, in the next six, nine, 12 months, then, then clearly Arsenal have to be very, uh, very astute in what they do financially. So any questions, do send them in on the Q&A and I'll hand back to Akil. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, you can raise your hand, which is a feature at the bottom. Um, if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll try and bring you in sort of when I can. Um, can I also give um, a, a shout out to a couple of new members that we've had who are from overseas? So I think, we, you know, that the, the lockdown has meant we've, we've learned a lot about sort of new things we can do and, and, and things like that. So these virtual events were obviously something we wanted to do just for just for our members to keep in touch, to give you guys a little bit of insight, information and a bit of content. But it has meant we've had some kind of uh, member, existing members who live overseas send us some really nice feedback saying they can now get involved and feel involved. And we've also had a few new members join us as well. So welcome to all the new members. If you're from overseas, you know, an extra thank you, especially if it's 
late where you are and obviously a, a big welcome to, to, to new members um, just generally as well. So before I bring the guest in, I'm just going to have, give you a very quick update um, on last week's Fans Forum. So the Fans Forum is, is, happens every about three months. Um, the AST send a rep in, all the other supporter groups send a rep in as well. Um, and then there's like a gold, silver, red away scheme, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a rep for all of those. So we get about an hour or so to um, ask Raul and Vinay questions and they give a bit of an update. So it was held virtually for the first time, um, which obviously, uh, you know, does bring its challenges. Um, but generally, it, it did go well. Um, and there was a few updates I wanted to share, and there's a few more we'll talk about kind of during it. But, I mean, obviously, Nigel and, and, and the team have been talking to you about finances and, and, and stuff like that. And Arsenal pretty much confirmed it. Rinai confirmed what the AST have been saying. Um, about kind of commercial uh, broadcast and match day revenue, which is at risk that that we all know and that that is quite a it, 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 it's a big deal. Um, so that's 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 big. Having said that, the club obviously chose not to furlough, and they're also not looking at any redundancies internally, which obviously is really positive because there are many people that probably a lot of people that we all know working for the club. So that that's obviously great. Um, I had a question on Luke about how the training ground is working. So if I briefly explain in a, in a minute, um, they, they call it kind of the London Colney Park. And what, what the thinking behind that was, was when, you know, players like Aubameyang or Lacazette were going for a jog or were even attempting to go and do any kind of exercise outside, it was obviously a bit dangerous. They were potentially getting stopped. People wanted selfies. People wanted, you know, um, autographs and stuff like that, um, which is natural, you know, if, if, especially if, if, if kids on their exercise see their heroes, then they kind of forget about the social distancing. So that was seen as quite dangerous. So what's happening at the moment is they only allowed about four or five players at a time. Um, the changing rooms and toilets are all locked. So a player is literally at home, gets ready, gets in their car, drives to the uh, training ground, does their exercise on the pitch, gets straight back in their car and goes home and then showers and stuff at home. So that's kind of how they're doing it. They're splitting it and spreading it throughout the day. So players aren't really um, interacting or engaging with each other. There was a question about um, refunds and apologies. I, I can't quite remember um, who submitted this, but obviously thank you for your question. Um, there has been information um, around refunds on the Arsenal website, um, particularly where they do kind of the, the update, update for fans bit. There was a bit about refunds, but if there's games that fans can't attend, i.e. behind closed doors, then there will be either a credit for um, next season or there will be a refund. Um, I know the club are looking at kind of bulk solutions and stuff like that just to refund outright. Um, but that, that, yeah, fans will be, I'm sure, will, well, will be looked after. And I think Rinai has confirmed this um, quite a few times. So there are a few, few other things, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll kind of bring in the guests now and then we'll kind of start, start talking about it. So I'm going to introduce um, Raf, Rafa Honingstein and Julian Laurence. Raf is obviously from uh, The Athletic now, but is, has, has attended our meetings regularly and Jules as well um, from ESPN. And Jules has obviously attended our meetings and you'll obviously recognise them from BT Sport and the European show. And I did joke about it before saying that this is like the, 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 the European show. And I was reminded it's not called that anymore, but Arsenal haven't been in the Champions League for a while. So I've kind of forgotten um, so guys, how are you? How's the lockdown been? And, um, yeah, just, just, it's, it's a strange time, isn't it? If I come to you, Raf, first. Yeah, it is a strange time. I think, um, you know, as football writers without football, it is a bit, um, uh, sometimes weird to, to understand what it is we're, we're meant to do. But of course the, the news stories haven't really stopped. It's just, uh, not football related as such, but more the politics and the, ins and outs of the medical concepts and all these kind of things, stuff that you'd rather not write about, but what can you do? Um, as far as me personally, I've been very, very lucky. Uh, I think if you live in Northwest London, you know, near, near greens and parks, you are blessed in a situation like this. It doesn't feel nearly as bad as it could be. Uh, and as it probably does feel for a lot of other people who are not as lucky as we are. So uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, it's been not too bad. Jules? 
Yeah, it's same, same, same for us here. Uh, the three children, my wife working from home and homeschooling and all that kind of stuff. But work-wise, it's been quite busy as well. Like Raf was explaining, this, even if there's not much to report on or things like that, there's always things to write or things to talk about uh, with news or transfer rumors, transfer news, all that kind of stuff. And, and for me, with Liga, having taken the great decision of stopping the season with still 10 games to go, I've, I've already... Uh, filed and sent my uh, season review, you know, as you do when the season <laughs> is over. Uh, it will be on the ESPN website soon. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I've been doing. Okay. I'm very happy to be here. I hope everyone is safe. Uh, and for the ones who have helped the club by, you know, responding to the Arsenal uh, response funds and everything to helping during this, this tough time, is, I think it was a very, very nice thing to do. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. It's very nice of you guys to to give up your evening for it. Um, before we kind of get into France and Germany, I'm just going to bring Tim Tim in. Um, obviously, there was, um, there's been a few announcements over the last 24 hours. We, we obviously had the, the PM out there at, uh, uh, pre-recording at seven o'clock yesterday. We had the questions in Parliament around three, and then we obviously had the, the, the stuff this evening as well. So I'm going to ask Tim, obviously, the most important question. When will hairdressers open? <laughs> that is a really important question. Um, <laughs> Look! <laughs> football might be behind closed doors before hairdressers open if you follow the document. It's page 30 of the government's document today where they say that they will um, permit cultural and sporting events to take place behind closed doors for broadcast. They do add an important qualification we might come back while avoiding the risk of large scale social contact and I think that's interesting in light of what the Premier League club said they wanted to do today which was not use neutral venues. Um, must stress that that is in the document as something that be, can be considered as stage two of the lifting of the lockdown arrangements and stage two is no earlier than the 1st of June and requires various tests that are too complicated. I have to ask Nigel about the, the statistical equation of what R equals but from 1st of June, it is potential for football to return. There was also a Premier League meeting today where they considered that and they have reiterated the desire to finish the Premier League, although they did also, I understand, talk for the first time about the financial consequences of if they are unable to finish the league. I'm sure these are the kind of things we'll talk to Jules and, and Rafa about. Most importantly today, though, and it would be really interesting to get the experience of France and Germany here was the FA stepped in and have, have said that they, have, they will make it mandatory that there is a result to this season. That means I think you cannot void the season but you have to produce a final league table and decisions to happen and it will be interesting to, to, to check the terminology and the understanding of that with the guys Akio, when you go to question with them um, in a moment. Um, I'll come back later on if no one else covers it on where Arsenal would finish if you had a points um, per game played system and where we might be playing next season. But I'll leave everyone to look at the table and work that one out. So the upshot of today, I think, is that the, the clubs are getting ready. They do want to talk to government about whether they can use their home stadiums rather than neutral venues. They also did something, I think Akilis came up at the fans forum, whereby they've agreed permission to ask players to extend their contracts beyond the 30th of June deadline, because yeah. otherwise you're going to have a confusing situation where players could stop on the 34th game of the season because they're out of contract. Yeah, so there's a working group, I think that Raul's actually sits on, um, and ultimately there is permission now for players to extend their contracts with, with, with clubs um, to cover the rest of the season. Um, there's obviously value in it for the player because the player can then finish the season and play. Um, and there's no real value of the player going back to his parent club because they can't play for their parent club. Um, so, yeah, that, that is all three parties have to agree it. It, it, it. it doesn't mean someone like Saliba can come back to Arsenal and play. He absolutely cannot. Um, but obviously, with the French season kind of fi um, finished, um, he obviously won't extend his contract there. So he will be back, but he won't be allowed to play. But it does okay. mean... Like Mari, for example, can, can obviously, that we can extend his contract. Just, just the final thing about that, because one or two people have asked questions. At this Premier League meeting today, Arsenal are represented by two people. It's a Zoom call a bit like this, and it's Raul, Sonelli and Vinay who attend that meeting. And they have 
been given us some indication of what they think um, and it has been very much that they are one of the clubs keen that the season is concluded. When you see the financial costs at Arsenal of not playing games for the rest of this season with any crowds and next season could be about 160 to 170 million, you perhaps understand why they're taking that view. Anyway, Akio, I'll let you bring the guys in um, and let's have a discussion about the return of football and how it might work. Thank you, Tim. Um, and also, just for everyone watching, if you do have questions, if you could do them in the Q&A, it would really help because it just helps structure and everyone else can then see what you're saying. So I know there's a few questions in the chat. If you were just to copy and paste it into the Q&A, it would be great so everyone can kind of just see. So, guys, again, welcome again. Um, I think we'll, we'll start with you, Jules, and we'll start with France. And obviously, France have made the decision to kind of end the season. I mean, France and Germany couldn't be any more apart, could they, in terms of what they're doing from a footballing sense? But they've obviously made the decision to, to kind of complete the season now. Is it fair? And what's the reaction been like in France from, from, from clubs, players and, and fans? It's changed a bit, which is the interesting bit, from, from when the Prime Minister on that Tuesday morning announced it two weeks ago, when he really took everybody by surprise. We've been briefed since the morning that... He could say maybe no football until August the 1st, but we didn't really expect no football until September, which then obviously meant that you could not finish the Liga and the Ligue 2 seasons as well. I think first people said, well, it's clearly not safe enough, or at least the government thought that it was not safe enough to play, so it's the right thing to do. There was a, quite a lot of the players in Ligue 1 who were not so keen on going back too early to play either. So I think it suited a lot of people around the game. Uh, and also, we were the first one after the Netherlands. So it looked like, OK, maybe there's something there. Then we all know that Emmanuel Macron tried to convince everybody around, around us to do the same thing, which no one did. So then we looked a bit like a bunch of idiots already. And then I think now a lot of people are thinking that maybe they took that decision a bit too quickly. They, were too, they rushed it a little bit and we could have waited easily another week, maybe even two weeks and see what was happening in Germany, for example. Or maybe even wait for the Bundesliga to start again and see how that evolved and how, what was that happening over there. And instead, they went very, very hard, very early on, on like, no, no football. And when you think that horse racing started again today, for example, which I think has driven a few, uh, few clubs, owners and presidents quite mad because football could have maybe started as well. So there's Lyon trying to overturn the decision, which I don't think would go anywhere. But certainly the frustration is, is growing a bit on what we are doing or what we've done and what the others around us are doing. And maybe there's a case for we should have waited a bit longer. Mm. How has it impacted the clubs? What are the clubs kind of, you know, obviously PSG are probably quite happy about it. But I mean, clubs like Lille, who have finished one point outside the Champions League place with about, what, 10 games to go. Lyon as well, I know, aren't happy. I mean, what's, what's been the sort of deal there? Yeah, I mean, you obviously, once the decision was taken and, and between that day and the, the final table and the, the average points per game that was decided and everything, everybody tried to fight the corner, which you would understand if it was your club, you would go for it. So, Olas, with, who is the, the Lyon owner and chairman, his team was seven. They had a, they had a ter terrible season and he tried to come up with some ideas. We could do playoffs, we could do this, we could do that. So, then Lyon could squeeze in and somehow manage to qualify for Europe, which no one really bought in um, but but you know f depending on the club and and you would lose more money than than others we, we know that the last two tv uh, money tv rights installments will not be paid especially the last one so that's 250 million that will never appear on any club's accounts uh, there's also a home matches that won't be played uh, you know obviously behind closed doors they would have been played but no, not played at all uh, yeah. So you lose money on that. You lose money in terms of merchandising and marketing and sponsoring, sponsoring and that kind of stuff. So it's hard to value already, I think. But let's say a club like PSG would probably miss out on around 100, mil 100 million euros, probably something like that, which is a lot of money, even if yeah. they have obviously a lot of money through yeah. their, their owners. Yeah. Raf, Germany is obviously very different. Um, it, it, it's due to restart. Similar sort of question, really. What's the reaction been like? from clubs, players and, and, and fans? I think really mixed. Um, I think there is a sense that maybe football is rushing back a little bit. Is this really safe? Is this really the right thing to do to spend, you know, millions or maybe at least a few hundred thousands on testing players every other day when, yes, there's a lot of capacity, but there's also people working in, in offices that reopen, working in shops, working in care homes who might not have that 
uh, access or might not have the employer pay for those tests. Um, so more questions of morality, uh, questions of player safety, with, you know, players are not quite sure, is this really uh, the best idea? Maybe I have a vulnerable partner at home. Uh, what if I expose her inadvertently? Um, so I think it's not a case of people, you know, being celebrating the streets, hooray, football is back. Uh, more of a sense of this is probably um, a necessity, uh, for, first of all, a financial one for the teams to have to come back because they were due another TV payment um, schedule, which uh, if they hadn't been paid, they would have missed 300 million euros, at which point about a third of the 36 professional clubs in Bundesliga 1 and 2 would have been basically more or less gone bust by the end of the summer. So they had to, from the outset, find a way to get back, uh, of course, behind closed doors, but just enough to fulfill the uh, TV contracts to put some games on. And I think because they've been quite open about that financial necessity uh, in a way people have accepted it but on the other hand of course then you cannot really then turn around and pretend that this is done for the morale of the people uh, you know uh, brings a bit of happiness back so that kind of cold um, and fairly sort of factual approach has also dampened I think the emotional attachment to it and for fans it's particularly bad because what football is really saying to the fans is to the organized fans to the match going fans is mm. you're not actually essential for our product. Our product is the game and we can go on without you. We don't want to, we want you to be there. We want you to make, um, make it a nice spectacle, but actually when it comes down to it, you're not necess necessary. And that is a painful realization. Of course, hopefully the one that will only be limited to a few months and then we can go back to normal, hopefully. Mm. And, and how's it going to affect kind of non um, playing staff. So I'm talking about the, the staff that need to be, you know, there will still be stewards, security, cleaners, all that kind of stuff. How's it impacting them and what's been the reaction from them? Because on one hand, they're obviously getting paid to do a job, which I'm sure they're pleased about after the lockdown, but at the same time, they might potentially having to take public transport and it's, it's obviously quite risky for them as well. Yeah, it is. I mean, I don't, I don't think we'll see too many um, stewards uh, in, mm. in the game. I mean, there's no there's no one to say like fans, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but uh, the, the concept, I think, has about 300 people, more mm. or less, inside the stadium in different zones. And they're not allowed to mix. And it's, uh, it's quite funny if it wasn't so sad that, for example, the press conference will be virtual. If you're one of the 10 journalists attending the game, and there's only 10, you can text a message with your question and then you can watch the uh, coach in question answer it, but only on a screen in the stadium. I mean, it's bizarre, but that's mm. kind of the reality of, of the situation. And um, the reaction I think has been, football has to do this because otherwise we will be fired. I mean, when it comes to people working for the clubs, for example, they mm. have furloughed very few people. Um, they haven't really um, released anyone as far as I know, at least not mass. And the players have been able to find an agreement with the clubs much easier and more smoothly than in the Premier League because we don't have a very powerful PFA. But also I think because there are no owners as such, it's much harder for a player to think, why should I take a pay cut if my owner is a billionaire? He can easily make up the shortfall. In Germany, there's no owner. So uh, it's easier, easier for the club to explain look, we all need to take a pay cut here. Otherwise, we have to fire the people in reception, in the back office, etc. And that's been uh, an easier process, therefore. Mm. Staying with you, Raf, we've had a question from Kevin Wright. And he's talked about, obviously, since the announcement, it has been reported that the um, infection rate has gone up again. So what's that sort of reaction been? Is that kind of a people started to question, actually, is it wrong for the football to start? And do you think it even could be, if it goes up for the next few days, could even it, it all be rethought? I don't think the two things are really connected because the reason <laughs> why the infection rate is going up is because uh, people are back at work. I mean, there's one case in a meat uh, production company where 200 people all infected each other. So you see a huge spike in a certain area, but it doesn't really involve, doesn't really affect the concept of the Bundesliga, which is, you know, even with staff, we're talking about 1,700 people in Bundesliga 1 and 2 constantly getting tested. The chance of them somehow affecting what happened in the global scale is, is very low. 
it's more questions of optics and more questions of morality, if you will. But there, we're now at a stage where hairdressers are open, kindergartens are open, playgrounds are open, even some swimming pools are open. So football doesn't look like an outlier as much as it perhaps in our head does when we're thinking, oh no, football is coming back because the whole of society, the whole of German, uh, the German economy has opened up to a certain extent. And that's why I think the football is seen as less outlandish in yeah. its attempt to, to make games happen. Which is maybe the issue here, as, as Tim said, it, it's likely we could be seeing football behind closed doors before any of us having a haircut, which is just a strange thing to, to think about. Coming to you, um, Jules, we've had a question from Wesley McDonald. What happens to the, um, the, the cup, like the cup final, the French cup final and, and all that kind of stuff? How is, is that just killed for the season or...? So they're still trying. They're still trying to plan them. Uh, I think there are talks between the, the federation and the league for the league cup final. Uh, so you've got PSG against Lyon and PSG against Saint Etienne in the two domestic cups. They were hoping to to play them when we thought we were still going to resume the season. Uh, to play them at some point in July. Uh, now they're thinking maybe late August. The PSG in August should be involved in, in the Champions League, maybe Lyon as well. Yeah. We don't know yet. They will have to play yeah. the second, uh, second leg of the last 16 against Juventus. So we, we're not sure. And, and also what happens, so if PSG win it both, then that means the fifth and sixth place in the league will go to the Europa League. Yeah. Uh, but what happens if it's Lyon or saint Etienne who win it? If it's really late in August or maybe in September, it might be too late for UEFA to register those teams for the Europa mm. League. So it's a, bit, it's a bit messy already. I think they want them played. But for example, saint Etienne have already said if he's behind closed doors at the Stade de France, we're not coming because yeah. we haven't been in a cup final since 1982. We have probably the best fans in the country, which is true, or some of the best fans in the country. And we don't want to come all the way to Paris just with our team, with no fans at all, when yeah. usually we would sell 40,000 tickets. So it's another tricky one that they would have to sort out at some point. Yeah. I know, um, Hilary, you've raised your hand and I will bring you in in a second. Um, one more question, Jules, for you about, about France. When um, um, it was announced, it was announced by obviously the PM. So how much input did the government have in it or was it kind of, was it a government decision and not really the French FA or did they kind of work together? How was that process from what you know? So it was 100% a, a government decision, which I think would be the same in every country. We saw in Germany when, when Angela Merkel had that big meeting with the, with the 16 region. And in the end, she clearly, was not, she clearly was not so... I mean, I know all the regions have their own like, you know, health system and stuff like that. But I think eventually, if the, if the government said you can play and you can go back, then you would. If they say you can't go back, like in France and the Netherlands, I don't think there's much that the leagues or the FAs can do anyway. But what was interesting in France is that for a long time, there were discussions between government and leagues and the FA to put a plan in place, which we had. And we had a day to start training. We had a day to start playing. We had a schedule, full schedule for games uh, and, and et cetera, for cups as well and all of that. And then suddenly the, the government over a weekend said, you know what, we looked at everything and it's just not safe enough. So we're sorry, but this has to stop. So I, I've always thought that it was always going to be a government decision anyway in every country. It might be a bit different in, in mm. certain countries, dif depending on their the, the political structure. But in France, it was certainly 100% what the government decided to do. Yeah. Raf, back to you. I mean, something that we've, we've talked about here, and actually I'm keen to get your view what you think will happen here as well. But there's obviously been, um, and, and Jules as well, actually, there's obviously been, I mean, it happened with the PSG game that was behind closed doors against Dortmund, wasn't it? When fans turned up outside. So I guess, is there a fear that that could happen in the Bundesliga? And obviously in England, with you know, we, I know this is going out to the wider population, but it's all Arsenal fans here. But it, it's we all think Liverpool fans might turn up at Liverpool Town Hall or, or outside Anfield if games are there when they're about to win the league. So do you think that's an issue for football in, in, in Germany first, but then England as well? So in Germany, this was a fear that was discussed by some of the clubs, but... Um... They understood that a lot of the organized fan groups, and we're talking about the hardcore fans, you know, not the ordinary sofa fan. He's not going to turn up anyway. Um, but they've been, they've been actually very engaged, helping out in charitable organizations uh, for corona um, affected people, working in hospitals. So they've done any, a lot of them have done really as much as they can to help the situation. So to expect them to make a point by, you know, breaking the, 
social distancing rules and somehow celebrating or protesting against it by congregating outside the stadium, it doesn't really tally with anything we've seen from these groups so far. So those fears have kind of gone away after a lot of conversations where people kind of said, you know what, we might be against it. We might think this is wrong, but we're certainly not going to be the ones uh, turning up outside the stadium. So it is not seen at the moment as a realistic uh, possibility, but just to make, um, you know, to threaten what would happen uh, if it was the case, uh, the, the Bundesliga have said that um, if we see these scenes outside stadiums and it, we might have to abandon the game then as a result, we will make sure that the fans who, who, who did this um, will see their team, whoever that team might be, be punished and be docked the points. So really there's absolutely no incentive uh, for you to turn up outside the ground and I hope that it won't happen. Mm. Jules, I mean, do you have a view? Obviously, with the PSG, it's that it was very early on in the in the in the kind of pandemic, but but still, obviously, it happened there. Yeah, it uh, it was a big issue in France, and I mm. think one of the main reasons why they decided to stop the season uh, there's a Marseille there was a Marseille PSG game scheduled at some point in March, and this is the biggest in the in the season, and and you would not have prevented thousands of Marseille fans if they had wanted, if their team had won for the first time against their arch rivals in, I don't know, nine years or 10 years, to go and gather outside the Velodrome, even 2,000 of them, it was, it was going to be very difficult to stop, I think. We're not as disciplined as the Germans, I can guarantee you that. The, just, just the point on PSG dormant, the difference was the PSG Ultras asked for the permission and the permission was given by the police, by the club, wow. by the, the region as well, that they could come at 2,000 or 3,000 of them. Uh, like you said, it was, it was very early on. On the same night in Liverpool, you had 44,000 at Anfield and I was one of them and the 3,000 Madrid mm. fans who travelled from Spain. So at the time, it was still like, okay, it's not ideal, but you could just allow it just for that one time. It was different. They just didn't came out of nowhere and, 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 and all gathered when no one expected them to. They were allowed to do and that's why they did it. I, I don't know if they would do it again, if they were not allowed to, but it was clearly one of the issues and maybe one of the biggest reasons why France decided to stop the season. Mm. Ralph, well, I had a question in um, around sort of sort of testing and, and, and if, if players are kind of tested and, and they're, they're obviously positive. I don't know if any testing's been going on, if there has been any players recently that have been positive, but if that continues to happen, and because obviously players will need to be tested, and, and if there are a few positive tests, then what do you think will happen to football? Will it continue? Are we too far down? It's going to be really hard, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I mean, we have a case now in the second division, uh, Bundesliga 2, where Dinamo Dresden, who are bottom of the table there, they've had two positive tests. And um, because the local health authority make the decision whenever there's a positive test, um, they decided that the whole team has to go into a two-week quarantine, which means that they won't be able to play okay. their first game. They won't be able to play their second game. And who knows when they'll be ready to, play, to come back. In the meantime, everybody else has to wait. We have to squeeze in those fixtures somewhere else. And uh, already the sporting integrity is, is affected. I don't think there's any way to, uh, to deny that. But the, what the league has said, look, um, we kind of expect this. We, we're testing 1,700 people. If one or two turn out positive, then we're hoping that maybe we've done enough with all the stuff we talked about earlier to make sure that even then we're not in a situation where we have to isolate the whole team, but maybe just isolate the the, the people that this particular player or staff member has had contact with for the last few days. But if the local health authority decide, no, we're strict, some are stricter than others, depending on where they're based in the federal system of Germany, then that might happen, uh, which again explains why they want to rush back because they also want to have then the time, maybe in July, to catch up with the games that they, they might have not happened because of quarantine in mm. May and in June. Um, of course, that only can work up to a limit if it's not one Dresden, but two or three Dresdens, or if one of those teams are Bayern Munich and Dortmund, then I think we'll quickly get to a situation where they might say, you know what, we tried our best, but it doesn't work. We have to stop and abandon the league. Uh, but we're not at that point yet, and everyone's hoping and praying that somehow they can squeeze this through or power through. Yeah. And what are your sort of views on neutral grounds? I know I'm going to bring Tim in, so Tim, be, be ready um, shortly. But I mean, there was a massive Sky Sports headline around sort of the Premier League against neutral grounds. Um, 
potentially there's in, integrity stuff there. But I mean, Jules, what, what's your view on if football does return in, in England now? Neutral grounds, does it work? Where should the football be played, in your opinion? And this is just an opinion, obviously. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's complete BS. I understand what the, the police are saying and say, and basically it's what if fans gather outside their stadium, then we can't police them, it's a problem, mm. blah, blah, blah. I, there's a few things. Uh, one, if they want to get out, like you said earlier, and if the Liverpool fans want to celebrate on, uh, you know, the town hall or city mm. hall or out on Anfield, wherever they want, they, they will, and mm. it, it will be the same problem. Mm. Two, uh, you know, it's more players having to travel whatever, whatever way they travel with their own cars, two different buses, three, four, I don't know, whatever. But if you have to move the players from Manchester down to Birmingham, the players from London up to Birmingham, because that's where you want them to play, because it has to be equal distance from each club. I think it's, I just think personally, you don't gain anything out of it. You lose in a way, and I can understand why some clubs are saying you lose the sort of home advantage. I know it's behind closed door, but it's still your own dressing room. It's your own yeah. pitch. It's, it's closer to your home, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of still advantage, even if it's behind closed door, there's still of good things for you to play in your own stadium than, than somewhere that you've hardly played ever before. So I don't like it. I don't like the idea. I can see why clubs are not happy with it and more than one as well. I don't know if they can find a, a, a resolution, a solution. I do think they will overturn that and it would be back to home games. But, but you know, yeah, yeah, it makes no sense. Raf. For sure, sort of view then, and I guess what what were their discussions in the Bundesliga about this? Sort yeah, of? so I mean, first of all, we don't have any neutral grounds. As such. <laughs> there's no Wembley, there's no St George's Park, so uh, we would have to use existing stadiums. And with Bundesliga one and two coming back at the same time, we'd be in exactly the situation that Jules described, where you don't have to send 36 teams around all the time, and they don't want to do that, especially when they can't put people in team buses, but they have to go in in people carriers or in their own cars have to go then to 36 different hotels because no one is at home. It doesn't really um, make a lot of sense. And I guess what you would gain in terms of maybe biosecurity by being able to um, protect the ground much, much better in the Bundesliga's opinion would be then lost by all the additional travel and hotel and all these kind of things that um, go against it. So in the end, it was never, it was never under discussion properly as soon as they said, okay, we will try with the help of this medical concept, with the help of um, very strict testing to come back, then they, they said, okay, so we're going to try and play home and away as long as the federal states allow us as normal. And then no one can complain. And then you at least have only half of those 36 teams traveling at any given moment in time. And the others will, will be situated in a, even in their own home or in a normal team hotel, which they always have. So, it uh, just wasn't seen as very beneficial to even start that discussion. Mm. There's, there's also been a, there's I think a commercial element to this as well, which is quite a lot of the clubs are reporting that they have large sponsorship deals that are tied in around naming or their commercial partners being involved at the stadium. And of course, you know, we could say that about our club with the Emirates. I have no idea the force majeure elements of the contract between Arsenal in the Emirates, but you can certainly imagine that if the games weren't played at the Emirates Stadium, they might be looking for some money back. You could say they've got lots of money because they're backed by a government, but you could also say that they're an airline that isn't taking very much in revenue at the moment and might be looking to save some costs. But I think as well as the sporting competition element and the perceived advantage of playing your games on your pitch, money has come into this as a factor as well. For sure. I mean, yeah. advertising, simple things like advertising boards. If you're at home, you have your own sponsors, you have your own partners. And if it's a neutral ground, what do you do? I mean, it's probably can be sorted out, but it would have been a gigantic logistical and legal headache. Tim, I mean, obviously there's been stuff in the, about today around kind of Richard Masters, I think came out and said that neutral grounds maybe isn't the best sort of idea. What, what, what have you heard and, and, and what's, what's the latest there? Well, I think that they've said that they have a meeting with the government later this week and they're going to ask them for approval to plan on the basis of using all of the club's 20 grounds. Now, the police so far have said they don't like that scenario, but perhaps I'll have to look at it in more detail. I will read out again this interesting line that in the government document published today, it does say 
while avoiding the risk of large scale social contact. So I think this will come down to the police and the local authorities and the government having confidence that fans won't turn up outside the stadium. Um, what the Premier League will also have to weigh up is the risk that if they do get going and that happens, does it bring your whole season down because everything stops or can you have a contingency? There's some really difficult decisions to weigh up here and they seem to have a meeting about every three or four days and I think today's a meet meeting, they agreed to have another meeting and the Premier League clubs are going to get together again next Monday. They also, of course, we're talking about behind closed doors, but you don't just start playing behind closed doors. And one of the reasons why I can guarantee we won't play on the 1st of June is the players won't be ready. And the guys might come in on this. So um, oh, I understand that the, that the medical team are saying that they will need about four weeks minimum to do a pre-season because they have to go back to doing sharp turns and physical contact and all the work to be fit enough to play a season. And so already I would say that the earliest they could get out there is about June the 10th, maybe even heading into June the 15th. So there is a long way to go, but the decision that they hope the government will publish later this week is that players can go back to full training. Because at the moment, they can only do what we can do, like up and down in the park, you know, running in a straight line, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a question we had in, I think, from Hillary Raff about what, what, how, has, how have German teams sort of prepared their players and how do you think, you know, Eng English kind of team uh, clubs will, 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 will they follow suit sort of thing? Well, they had to follow the um, local restrictions and some um, local governments were quite lax. They said in small groups, you can come back. Some teams have already been training since uh, early April or mid-April and some had to wait a little bit longer. Uh, and they're saying this has been unfair. That's a point that Werder Bremen, for example, made. That they have mm. a much stricter local government who didn't let them train properly. Uh, now, I think when we get to Saturday, every club will have been in proper real training, inverted commas, for at least two, some of them three, three and a half weeks, which still isn't a lot. And there is a concern by some players who, um, you know, whether in public or in private are saying we might have injuries, we might not be 100% ready, the match fitness isn't there. But again, um, football feels that there is no real um, benefit in waiting because if you just delay it one more week, yes, you might have more training, but you don't really get match fit by having another week of training necessarily. So there is, again, like in so many things, no easy solution and certainly no perfect answer, just degrees of imperfection. And uh, one point I wanted to make earlier is that I think the Bundesliga have with some, some degree of success argued quite, uh, quite well that most people um, will have to negotiate uh, coronavirus in a similar way that they do. They might be more under the spotlight. They might carry with them sort of politics and morality and, and money. But in effect, all these difficult questions about testing, about quarantine will all come into play when it comes to the people working in the pub or working in a cinema or in a theater, all these things that are going to open up over the next few weeks. So it's just football is more, more exposed to those discussions and trying to make the, the most out of it as best as it can. Jules, I mean, obviously, you, you, I mean, and Raf as well, but Jules first, I mean, you, you obviously, you, you know a lot of the French players playing in England and, and, and stuff like that. How are they generally feeling? And I guess the fitness thing is an issue because they haven't had any competitive training for a while. So it will, they need all, almost like they need a pre-season. But, but before they get to that, how are players feeling about playing again? I mean, the ones I know and the ones I talk to, uh, it's a bit mixed. Some are really excited to come back. They don't really feel that there will be any issues with, with safety or health, health, health problems or anything like that. Others uh, maybe a bit more unsure and they want to, to make sure that everybody, everything is safe before, as safe as it could be, because they all, also all know that it would never be 100% safe anyway. The virus will still be here, but it would be here in September, in October, in November, in December, and all of that. So, but it's, it's, I, I thought it was quite positive overall. Uh, some might not say exactly how they feel, and they maybe would not tell me, uh, I don't want to play again at all until September or October. I don't know, but the ones that we talked about it with, they were, they, they were happy to go back training, even individually, go back to, the tra to their training grounds, uh, getting ready. They, I think they've missed, they've missed the dressing room for sure. Uh, they've missed playing as well. The, the, just just the, the one thing, the difference with, um, 
with a, pre a proper pre a real preseason and, and a summer break is that in the summer break, they really take a break. And yes, some of them are a bit more serious than others. But trust me, in the summer, especially the first 10 days, they do nothing and they eat and they have fun, which is what they should do after a long yeah, season. Mm. This time was very different. I think they were all very careful from the beginning, regardless of how long the lockdown was going to be. Yeah. But they were very good and the clubs were on their cases all the time about their weight, about how much fitness they were doing, what they were eating, etc., etc. So I think they would be in much better shape going back to training now than they would be, for example, in July the 1st when they, when they report back after three or four weeks yeah. of holidays. Of course. And Raf, before I come to you, just a, a, a quick look to attendees. Obviously, if you have questions, you can come in. If you just raise your hand, which should be an option on the bottom of your screen or the bottom of your mobile as you look at it, um, or device, if you raise your hand, I will bring you in. And it would be nice to have a couple of you kind of come in and ask the guys questions too. Raf, I mean, you obviously know players playing here as well. Um, I mean, generally, is it similar to Jules? I mean, how, how are they sort of feeling about it? Yeah, I think it's a similar case. I mean, some are actually really happy that they can kick a ball around because mm. they felt a bit lost. Maybe like we, like we did as football journalists, uh, without without your profession being able to to be done properly. Um, but of course, there are there are concerns. I think what is important and what does affect the um, perception of the problem is that so far, from the twelve positive tests we had in in the Bundesliga, one and two with staff and players all of them have been asymptomatic. So they found people who otherwise wouldn't have known that they had coronavirus, who had no idea, who are not coughing, who don't have a fever, who don't have anything. And I think if this persists, if these are the only cases, hopefully, then I think after a while, people might be more comfortable with that risk uh, and might perceive it in a different way than if they're exposed to you know, the pictures from hospital where where all the people are dying and, and you hear only the bad stuff. Um, so, um, but we're still at a stage where a lot of things are unknown. And I think it's very natural that footballers feel, feel worried and feel concerned, especially for, uh, for their families as well. But again, you know, uh, kindergartens and schools will open soon. So the chances are that you have a much higher um, chance of your children um, or if you're a teacher getting it in school, then play, being one of the 1,700 people who are tested every three, three days uh, to play. And also, um, if you have um, family members that you're concerned with uh, as, as a member of staff or as a, as a player, you can also get them tested as courtesy of this program, yeah. which is very, very useful and I think has reassured a lot of people. Raf, are, they, are the players anxious or aware of the financial issues that are coming you know, in the medium to longer term. I mean, also in this government document today, it, it comes as close to saying that we might not be back in, in stadia as fans until a vaccine is found, or they couldn't even put a timescale on it. We could be looking at behind closed doors for another season, and that's not scaremongering at all, um, and, and running longer. And the AST did the financial analysis, which showed that Arsenal lose 150 million pounds if that happens. And that's assuming a positive scenario that broadcasters keep paying and sponsors largely pay. Play players are going to earn what the next contracts might not even be half of what they get now. They, they might be a third. Is that, is that, and obviously we've seen the Meza Ozil situation and Arsenal did have some pay cuts. Is it filtering into the psyche of the players yet? Or is it a bit far away for them really to have tuned into that? I think it's still a bit too far away because the clubs themselves don't understand just yet how bad the damage will be. Uh, there's a best case scenario. There's a worst case scenario. I mean, who knows? Maybe in September, October, we might be in a position where they have mass testing, which can turn around very quickly and you almost make it a public health exercise to test 60,000 people before they get into the stadium. And that might be also the regime if you want to take an airplane. I think things are moving quite quickly in that respect. And we might see a different um, scenario on the ground before Christmas. But of course, um, with uh, there being severe problems, I think German football has to come back to the players and says, look, you might have deferred now your wages for three months, but this was the, under the assumption that normality will return. Uh, if this goes on, if the best we can do is play the odd game behind closed doors and we have to have breaks because people still get affected, etc., 
we might have to talk to you again. And I think that that discussion is unfortunately likely to happen at some point. I'm going to bring Jim Clark in, who has a question. So, Jim, um, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak to us. And obviously, thank you for your question in advance. Hi, Echo. Can you hear me? Hi, Yep, go for it. Uh, just a transfer question. Um, do we sell Aubameyang for cheap this summer, or do we get one more season out of him and then go for free? Jules? That's a good question. That's the million dollar question. Well, not really a million dollar, but it probably cost you a bit more than that if you wanted to buy him. Uh, it's an interesting one, obviously. You could always argue and, and we could always talk about how, how it got to this point. And maybe someone like Aubameyang should have never been, seeing how important it is for Arsenal, they should have never been in this situation with just one year left in this contract. But that's, this is an issue that's been going on at the club for, for way before that anyway. Um, it's a good one. Do you, considering his age and, and how much he's paid, but also how, much, how many goals he brings to you and he's your club captain as well, let's not forget. He's someone who loves the club, for sure, but he's also someone who wants to play in the Champions League, for example, regularly for the next, I don't know, three or four years that he's got left in his career, which, again, you can completely understand. What you do as a club, they, I think they will, they will talk at some point. They haven't done it because of the current situation, but they will do for sure. And then you see, you see what Arsenal can offer if they want to offer something. You see why he's ready to accept, if he's ready to accept something, or if he would rather go and, and see somewhere, somewhere else what, what's out there for him. I think if you're any other clubs and you're looking for a striker and you just want someone, not for the long term, but for short term to mid term, that will guarantee you at least what, 15 or 20 goals a season, you'd be crazy not to look at Obama Young with one year left on his contract that you can get maybe for 20 million pounds. Uh, that's why I think it's, it would be harder maybe for Arsenal to keep him than for another club in the Premier League or somewhere else to buy him, if you see what I mean. So I, I, I'm, that's when I'm happy not to be Raul Sanieri or his family or anybody else to try to, to find a way out of this because I think it's a very, very tricky one because you could also see, and I finish quickly, why you've got Martinelli, you've got Nketiah that has done really well, both of them, especially Martinelli. You've got Lacazette who has one more year left on his contract compared to Aubameyang and who's younger as well. So maybe you could think this is the right time to, to let him go and get a bit of money for him. I don't know. Mm. I, think we have, I, mean... I think Jules is selling him, basically. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I get from the... I would keep him forever. <laughs> there, there, there was, I mean, we, I, I always plan to do sort of a little bit of more football and players for the last sort of 10, 15 minutes. So, so it's a good segue. I mean, there's a question from Nicholas Charles about Saka as well. And obviously Saka's contract, he's only got a year left. Him and Aubameyang are, are kind of with, both got a year left. Um, I mean, just, just from the fans forum, it was, I mean, you know, the fans forum is Raul Senendi is, is, is there. Um, but out of respect, you know, nobody talks about individual players because we're not going to get answers. But Raul Sanoli did say he completely understands, I think, the worry of fans. So, it, it, you know, it, it's something I'm sure the club are working on. But on kind of Saka, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't expect you to tell me if he'll sign the contract or not because you probably don't know like the rest of us. But how important is it that young players like that do stay at Arsenal? And I think... The words, the words Nicholas Charles used would be it would be an absolute disaster to see a young player like that leave Arsenal Football Club. What would be your sort of views there? I'll start with Raf, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, if, the, the problem is that Arsenal, and I think Jules alluded to this, the, the kind of market that Arsenal are in, um, you have to rely on the suckers that you can produce yeah. if you want to have any chance of getting back to the level where he can compete with the richest clubs in the league. So um, apart from the symbolic damage, if you will, and from the message that it sends that a young player basically doesn't believe in Arsenal, he thinks he needs to make that step somewhere else to grow or to, to make the money that he thinks is worth, it would really hurt, I think, the whole of the strategy, if, if that is the strategy. Um, I'm not so sure with the current Arsenal um, uh, executive what, what exactly the strategy is but it should be the strategy that you build yourself on having two or three suckers and then you keep adding if you lose the bottom of your pyramid as, as it will then it's going to be much harder to build pieces on top and uh, it would be I agree it would be a disaster if you were to lose them mm. Jules? 
I think they will, they will really push hard to keep him and, and rightly so because I agree with everything Raf just said and I think it's clearly the way forward for the club as well is to rely on, on, on the academy, on the academy graduate, the one who are good enough and I, and I believe there's some very good ones at under 16 level as well and at the under 18 level that can come through like, like Saka did and Martinelli to, to, in a different way but yeah. that, that kind of spirit. So I think Saka is very important. It will send the right message back to Halen as well which is very important too. And, and also, you've got more leeway. I mean, no offense to Aubameyang, but Aubameyang is already on 200 a week. You know, if you sign him, if you give him a new deal, he has to get a pay rise. That's what you do when you, get, mm. when you give new deals to, to players. It's easier to give a pay rise to Saka and not go in the red than to give a pay rise to Aubameyang, like we saw with Meze Ozil, because it will, you know, the numbers will be much higher, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah. I, th I think it's another interesting one uh, that they will have to, to sort out very quickly. George, I've had a question from Stephen Humphrey, and, and, and I was actually going to ask this. And I remember um, it was the opening uh, day of, not this season, last season. So it was Unai Emery's first game. And obviously, you know where I sit, and you came, you tapped me on the shoulder. I was all excited about the Unai Emery um, era, which obviously didn't go too well. But there was someone you mentioned to me, and you said the words, Matteo Guendouzi, and you said, watch him. <laughs> How do you think Wenduzi's done over the last kind of season and a half? And, and where would you kind of rate him? And where do you think he's at in his career? So I'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a bit biased. I have to, to let everyone know about that. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> they, I like him a lot, not just mm. because he's French or not just because he's from Paris, but we've got a good relationship. And I think he's done extremely well, considering where he was coming from in the French second division, how young he was and what his game is about, because... It could easily be someone who just passed the ball sideways, two yards there, three yards there, and be very conservative, not taking many risks. But that's not his game. Whether he plays with Arsenal against Manchester City, like, like his first game uh, last season, uh, when he just arrived, no, nobody knew him, including you. Uh, or we played for Lorient against Orléans, who rubbish in the second division, and he bosses that game. He would be the same. He would go forward with the ball. His first thought would be to look forward, to try to pass the ball. And there would be risk there. And we saw him in his first season. He, he was caught out at times with the ball 30 yards from Ben Leno's goal. And, you know, it, it would create danger at, at times. But I think he's a wonderful talent. And, of course, he's 21 years of age, so he will have to be more mature. He will have to improve a lot of aspects in his game, his personality, his approach to the game, uh, what he does off the field as well. But again, because he's young, Martinelli, you know, has similar things. The, the more mature they will get, the quicker, the better they will become, which is normal. I can tell you 30-year-olds who are not mature at all. Neymar is not very mature either, and he's far older than them. So mm -hmm. this will come. I just think that people, because he started so well in many respects in what was quite a difficult start of the season when he was his first season, I think people got um, really demanded with him and they were quite harsh on him. And when, when he was not maybe as good as in other games because he played a lot and he was quite tired because his game, he gives a lot in every time he plays. I think, I think people were quite harsh with him. I think he's a wonderful talent and I think he could be the future or part of the future yeah. at Arsenal. Right, Jeffrey. I will come to you in a second. Just one more question from Harry Gooch, and it was something I was going to ask anyway. But it's about Saliba. Obviously, he's he's had a season at Saint Etienne, which has obviously finished earlier than he would have liked. But generally, how's he done? And 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 I guess what sort of player are Arsenal getting next season? And do you expect him to to start playing from day one, or do you think it's going to be a gradual kind of um, you know introduction? So he had a really good season, uh, apart from the injury that yeah. came yeah, in November, the metatarsal, uh, which, which stopped him. But before that, he was very good after that. I don't think there was enough time for him to come back before the season was stopped anyway. Uh, I, I think he's a wonderful player. I think he's a wonderful talent. He's a modern centre-back who can run with the ball, who, can, who has pace, who is very strong, who is good in the air, who has two feet. He, he has maturity and maybe he's got a bit of that French arrogance, which I don't think is, is bad for him. So I think he will come over and think, do you know why I can come here and, and have an impact, have a positive impact on this team, on this squad and everything. So maybe he will still need a bit of time to adapt. Uh, but I think that he's a great signing. It was very good to sign him last year and to, to leave him alone in France. And I think he will definitely come with the, 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 the ambition to, to be a starter in the team next season. Great. Jeffrey, I'm going to bring you in. Um, if you unmute yourself, um, thank you for joining us tonight and feel free to ask your question. 
I was just going to ask about, well, I was going to say that I understand the reason for the focus on this season, and, but it is a bit like my move, move, um, moving the deck chairs in the Titanic. David Nabarro of the WHO said he didn't think there'd be a vaccine for two years if we get one. So that implies surely that uh, large crowds wouldn't be able to go into Cedia. Uh, they're always already talking about uh, cancelling the Olympics again next year and the Euros. And there's a real possibility that full crowds won't get in for another couple of years. So how, I mean, my view is they shouldn't continue this season, but that's a different matter. But, but how are they going to focus on the finances for potentially one or two seasons without stadia being full or even having half full or even empty? Thank you, Jeffrey. Raf, do you want to attempt to? Um, that's uh, cheered everyone up. That question. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but I think it's a it's a it's a very relevant one. And um, I mean, I can only answer from the German uh, perspective. What clubs are telling me is that we drive as if we're in a fog. We drive as far as we can see. That might only be five meters, but we can. If we stop, we die. So they just have to keep going as much as they can try to fulfill their obligations. If they lose the TV money, they're all dead. So there's a real need to at least put, put those games on. And you can turn it around, Jeffrey, because if you think that there's no chance of football coming back in a normal guise in two years, it makes it even more imperative to, to do something in the meantime because you cannot wait until then. All the clubs will be bust. So as much as it's uncomfortable and, and doesn't feel right at all in some way, the Bundesliga have, have said and have realized that we, we have to do it. And if you allow me, and Tim might, might come back on this, but I think what people haven't understood, uh, really what hasn't really been properly understood in the UK is with the Premier League is that the next big TV payments for the domestic rights, which is the big chunk, the half of the all payments are June, July. So just imagine that the Premier League now saying, you know, we're not going to come back in August or September. The rights holders are not going to wait they're going to say, what, what is going on? We haven't had football since March. They're not going to pay out at that moment. So even the Premier League, who are in a relatively comfortable position, will come under huge pressure. Yeah. Oh, Tim, it's, there's, been, there's, been a, there's been, just sorry, there's been a question from Sarah about broadcasters, actually. And generally, I mean, answer, answer that bit as well. But also, have the broadcasters been kind of involved in any of the discussions for football to start again? Um, because of all that money and then looking forward to, to next season as well, as, as, as Raf just mentioned. Oh, yes, very much so, because they are the, they're the key funder and they would also have contracts mm. that have certain force majeure or requirements of where games are played and, and how much. And, and they will probably end up, and this will vary across different sports and different leagues, but broadcasters will be aware that they don't want to totally pull the plug on their partner because then there's nothing left to show next year. It is, an, it is a neutral relationship in in the medium term. But to, to answer Jeffrey's question, and we did discuss this a lot um, with David Ornstein when we, last time when we particularly dug into the pay cuts at Arsenal. And one of the things we discussed was, had it been worth all that pain and the arm twisting? And I think they had to bring Arteta in to lean on half the squad to persuade them to take the pay cut of 12.5%. And clearly that's only the beginning. That, you know, if we are behind closed doors next year, those players will be taking much bigger pay cuts or if they don't, well, a lot of clubs won't exist anymore, basically, because they won't, you know, the, the clubs will become creditors to them. This is going yeah. to restructure mm. football as we know it. I think, Raph, Jules, you know, we're going to have to rethink how we watch behind closed doors, rethink how we attend, rethink the idea of international travel to games. It, I don't think this is a two-month hiatus. This is a structural change to the, to, to the way... We engage with football and good things and bad things come out of it. We've got 151 people were on tonight. So that makes us a record for an AST meeting. So, <laughs> you know, things change. <laughs> Do you want to quickly rattle, rattle through. We've got about five minutes left and we'll rattle through a few questions. If there are any questions people want to raise their hand and come in, please do i probably won't have a chance to look at the q a again so if you do have a question just raise your hand quickly actually for, for you tim do you think the premier league will now look at the bundesliga as that sort of guinea pig it's, it's something that nicholas has asked um and if that goes wrong could we see the premier league not coming back at all this season 
Oh, well, it's definitely a, a best practice model, isn't it? So everything that the mm. Bundesliga gets right, that's great, can be replicated. Anything that doesn't go well, you think of a different way of doing it. I'm, I'm sure they are delighted that there yeah. is a major league out there going first to watch and learn from, yeah. yes. Mm. Jules, there's a question from Andrew, and, and you talked about your sort of dislike of neutral grounds and stuff. And we, we briefly touched on it, but I mean, the integrity thing that, you know, if a team's played away to a, a team, say, you know, Brighton have already been to, to kind of, I don't know, Burnley, and then when Burnley are coming to Brighton, it's at a neutral ground. I mean, do you think then we're going to be having legal challenges or this season's always going to be talked about? Because someone could go down because they've potentially played not at home enough this season, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we to go back to what we said at the beginning, the sporting mm. merit, you know, you have to finish the season and it has to be done to sporting merit. The closest we could get to that is certainly not in neutral venues. That's why mm. I, I, I'm really against it. I don't get it. And, and I think at least, even if it's behind closed doors, like we said, at least make those home games being played at home for all those teams. If you think about Brighton, they have, what, City, United... Um, and then to be to other maybe Arsenal and someone else go, having to, to go to the to the Amex. So I think even if it's behind closed doors, at least those clubs, especially the ones fighting for something, whether it's against relegation, whether it's for the Champions League or for the Europa League places, I'll, I'll, I'll at least give them the chance to play those games at home and to make it as fair as possible. I know nothing is fair because it's so yeah. weird what we're going to go through, but yeah. yeah. Raf, there's been a really interesting question from um, Nicole actually. And it's about kind of transfers. And do you think this whole pandemic will actually make players think, you know what, I'm not sure I want to move too far. I want to stay closer to home. Or if I'm settled in a, in a, in a city or a country, I want to stay there. Because moving actually this summer or whenever the window opens is actually really risky for not just them, but their own family as well. Do you think we might see a little bit of a mindset change? And the second question to that is my own, is around transfer fees. Do you think we might actually, gone are the days of the 200 million Neymar players and we're going to see it significantly reduce? Well, I think the second question is, is easy to answer. I think you'll yeah. definitely see a depression in value, at least this summer. How long it will continue will just be directly uh, correlating to how quickly football can come back as normal, uh, being fully online. So you could see two years of depressed value, certainly when it comes to the transfers, but then things bouncing back quite quickly, uh, as it might do in the wider economy. Um, with the, with the first question, I'm not so sure that uh, players will really be um, thinking about, you know, where do I want to be during a pandemic? Um, I mean, if they do, then it's not good for the Premier League. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, or London. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, no, but I think what, what has happened already is that players who otherwise thought about leaving the summer, and Obama Young might be one of them, are thinking or are finding themselves, A, with not really having that market that they thought they would have, because even the biggest clubs have to be very, very careful how they spend the money, which they might not get back, um, or they might have to budget for losses. And they might be more tempted, at least we've seen one or two situations like that in the, in the Bundesliga shaping up, even with Jaden Sancho perhaps, to just stick around, to say, you know what, I have a contract here, it's fine, I will move next year. And it might even be in the club's, um, interest to say, I'm going to sell next year. Why should I sell for 2020 prices when in all likelihood 2021 might look a little bit better and I can get 100 million rather than 50 now? Of course, it doesn't apply to players who have only got one year left uh, on their contract because your club hasn't been looking after the contract situation properly. You're on mute, Akil. Oops. Uh, Lawrence, I've, you've got 20 seconds. I've just brought you in. Um, would you like to ask your question? Lawrence? Still on mute. If you just unmute yourself, Lawrence. Potentially you might have done that by accident. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Tim, on that, on that last question. I guess... Um, Jules, I mean, generally on Arsenal, on sort of Mikel Arteta, how's he settled in? What's your view very quickly in sort of two minutes? I, I think he's been great. He's been fantastic. And the work he's done during this pandemic, during the lockdown, how he's been with the players, the, the continuous contact that he's been. I mean, I see 
from a PSG point of view with Thomas Tuchel not really being very present because that's not his style, especially during this break. Uh, with Arteta, who's been on the phone constantly with players, doing those videos, sessions, analysis, all of that, uh, which I think has been great. Different managers, different style, all of that. I think he's been brilliant. And just to go back to the last question, I think there's a lot of fun to have with swap players. I mean, if you're a sporting director right now and you look at your squad and say, you know what, let's, let's try this one. Let's try to swap Aubameyang for Ansu Fati. Let's try to swap Aubameyang for Lewandowski. Who knows? Maybe one day someone will say, yeah, okay, let's do this. You know, it's, it's just brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. S same question, Raf. Obviously, I know you have sort of links with Arsenal, and obviously you you help her with his book and stuff like that. But generally, how's what's the feeling at Arsenal, and how do you think Mikel settled in? Well, I, I know, and um, I can tell you that uh, Per Mertesacker was Ateta's biggest champion even before uh, the Emery um, reign started, okay. and would have uh, liked to see him installed even then, and, and I think pushed for him as much as he could in his the guys then where he didn't really have any real power and still doesn't at that level. Um, so that says to me that he's just highly respected and seen as somebody who brings a lot of personal integrity, but also know-how, uh, which I think is the main key these days. You can get quite far if you're just a charismatic figure, if you can motivate your players. But now most of them would have been exposed to at least one manager in their life who really helped them perform better, either because he coached them properly or he set them up tactically, which benefited the team. And players now expect that. If you can't do that as a manager, you lose the dressing room much quicker than if you're being a, you know, a horrible person or you know, don't have the authority. It's about what you can bring to help players. And all the indications are that I've heard, it's all secondhand, I must say, because I haven't seen him train. I, don't, I can't tell you what he does. Yeah. Are very, very positive. And they all think that he's going to be the right guy to take Arsenal forward. But of course, he needs help uh, in this very difficult uh, financial environment that Arsenal find itself. Yeah, there was even in the fans forum, Raul Sanelli did, did talk about how Arteta, as you say, both of you, about he's been on the, you know, video calling players. He's also getting players to mix with other players who are outside of their friends group because he's trying to keep that morale going. And he's also um, sort of had sessions with um, coaches from Stan Kroenke's other teams as a bit of sessions with the Rams and things like that. Um, where coaches have kind of talked and they've shared ideas and they've been learning stuff about each other. So maybe that's one positive that we, we have had from being a part of that sort of KSC thing. So Tim, I'm going to come to you for the final question. Um, sporting outcome, I know you've been kind of itching to, to talk about this. Um, well, st stage is yours, my man. Well, well, this is the great dilemma of all the executives who sit around that Premier League table deciding what might happen. So, and this is, this is some of the scenarios you could see and, and Jules and Rack can come in, what, what would you do? If you finished the season as now and declared the table as final, then Arsenal come ninth, which doesn't give them any European football next year, probably be seen as a big problem. If you did points per game, it only changes one thing in the entire table. And it's quite an interesting and enjoyable thing is it moves Arsenal up one place over Spurs. Um, now, Spurs will complain for years and years and years if that happens because that one game is a game in hand at Manchester City. Probably, you would think, Arsenal are going to get more points on an average points-per-game basis than if that game had been played. But who, who knows? We'll who just knows? Get the, we um, can get the lasagna out again. <laughs> <laughs> then, to make it even more interesting, if Arsenal come eight, it doesn't qualify for Europe unless you allow for Manchester City being banned from Europe by UEFA, but the case they have taken to CAS, which is the European Legal Sports Court, can't sit at the moment because CAS can't meet. So nobody quite knows whether or not eighth place in the Premier League will deliver a European place. I don't know you, whether our two European experts have got any more insight onto how that might work out for the eighth place team in the Premier League. Well, I think, I think, I think City will, I don't see how Cass can resolve that matter before uh, the start of the season. So they could just decide to suspend the suspension and wait until they can. So City will be in Europe next season, which will be to the detriment of eighth place and whoever finishes in eighth. Um, and, and for Arsenal, it's as, as appealing as it is, if you're an Arsenal fan to go above Spurs on points per game, I think those games will be played anyway. So they will have to do it on the pitch. And so maybe they have a chance. I mean, we don't, we don't even know what the European season might look like next year. 
Um, mm. A very truncated competition with no group stages in the Champions League and Europa League. Um, does it have then a knock-on effect on the money that you make? I guess it must have because UEFA need to do a deal with the broadcasters. If there's fewer games, then fewer money will go into the prize pot, etc. So it might not be the be and end all for Arsenal to qualify for the Europa League. Um, but whatever, whatever the outcome is, I think unless we see the games um, taking place, it's going to be very, very messy, which is, I think, with all the, the problems that, and the headaches that games now behind closed doors cause, is still a more elegant or, shall we say, less inelegant uh, outcome than all the other considerations. Yeah I, I, yeah, I would agree. And even if it goes into August, September, getting this one finished is so important for so many reasons, isn't it? Yeah. Right, on that note, I think we'll end it there. Um, I want to thank Raf and Jules for joining us this evening. Um, I think we, we really enjoyed having you guys on. We've had record numbers. I think we've had about 45, 47 questions in that we've answered about 43 of them. Um, so apologies if your question wasn't answered. I was trying to keep up with everything. Um, and also I was trying to pour a drink halfway through, which you might have noticed as well. Because as I've said, Jules and Raph, this is like a night out for me now. With no football, <laughs> no so no pubs, this is this is as good as it gets. So um, everyone, please stay, stay, stay safe out there. I know there's been uh, stay some alert. message... So yeah, stay alert yeah. yeah there's been some messages from the PM. <laughs> follow the rules um but obviously you know look after yourselves look after your family we'll hopefully be back um we, we haven't started planning our next virtual event but i'm sure you know as long as the numbers are healthy and we get good feedback from our members and we'll certainly be organizing more so i'll have to me and tim will have to go in our black book again to see what guests we can get so jules raf thank you um you guys stay safe yeah. as well hope thank your you families are well you and we'll speak to you soon Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.